During my senior year of high school, one of the requirements for graduation was the completion of a senior project. This was a project that took place over the three years in high school, sophomore, junior, senior year, that uh, was, was uh, eventually turned into a binder or a portfolio that we would submit for review. It included a bunch of small projects we would do throughout the years, uh, mostly small single page papers or inventories, but also included some major projects, a job shadow and an interview with an employer, uh, and then culminated really in this massive, uh, this massive research paper that we had to do on any topic we wanted as long as it was approved by the school. And then after this binder was presented, we would go and do a 10-minute presentation in front of a couple of teachers and some community members and uh, one of the classes at our high school. And to fast forward, to make a short, a long story really short, I come up to the point in my senior year where I am to submit my portfolio for review, and I don't have a portfolio to submit. Because somewhere along the line in my junior year, for a variety of reasons, none of them good, I had kind of gotten to this point where I was not going to do my senior project. I was planning to graduate. I had some illusions that I was just going to throw it together and everything was going to work out. Uh, but I got to this point, my senior year, the day I'm supposed to turn in my portfolio, I have nothing to turn in. And just the guilt of the previous year and everything, the consequences that I was going to face, kind of came crashing down on me. And there were consequences. The consequences for not submitting your portfolio on time was that you didn't get to walk at graduation. You could still complete everything and receive your diploma, but you didn't get to walk with the rest of your class uh, for the ceremony. And so immediately following that day of school, I drove home, I got to the house, walked right past my mom in the living room, straight to the den where my dad was sitting. He had just got off a long shift at the fire department. And I said, Dad, I have to tell you something. And he just stopped everything, and I just laid bare everything that I had done. I just presented all of my failures, and not just my failures that I didn't do what was required of me, but all the ways I had lied and deceived over the last year and a half, because that's what I had done. I had lied to my parents time and time again. They were involved parents who were trying to get me to that point where I was taking care of my own stuff, so they would ask how everything's going, and, and I would tell them I was taking care of what I needed to take care of, even though that wasn't true. I was manipulating things behind the scenes, keeping uh, paper that was, that was updating on the status of my portfolio. I was keeping that from that. When my friends would come over on days that we were working uh, in the homeroom class on our portfolio, I'd be like, hey, don't, don't bring that up to my parents. Don't even let them know in an attempt to, to, to move the conversation in a different direction. I had lied and misled my parents for, for over a year. And here I was just laying that all bare for my dad, telling him all I had did, really just presenting myself to be fully known to my dad. Not telling him the, the, the vision of me that I wanted him to see, you know, the, the great son or the perfect student, the guy who never failed and took responsibility for everything. Instead, the kind of the wreck that I was. The immature young man who, who had character failings, who needed to grow and learn responsibility. In that moment of presenting myself with all of my warts, in that moment as a young man, I, at least for the first time as a young man, I got to experience what it was to be fully known and fully loved. Because as I presented that to my dad, I was just met with this overwhelming sense of love. I don't remember the entire conversation, but I really remember three things he said. One, he forgave me. He loved me and he forgave me that I was going to go ahead and now I was going to have to tell my mom everything I had told them. I was going to have to go to the, to the other room in the house, just right down the hall and tell my mom everything. And she was going to be even more hurt because for her, watching me graduate was a huge deal. And then I was going to have to, after this, figure out how I was going to rectify the situation to the best of my ability. But from both my mom and my dad in that moment, I just got this experience, this moment of unconditional love. Here I was as this broken teenager, 18-year-old, and my parents loved me despite all of the ways that I hurt them, how they were going to experience the consequences that were for me. They were going to have to experience those too, and they loved me. And as we're looking at Psalm 51, that's really what we're looking at. We're looking at a psalm of repentance. David writing this poem, repenting to God, and how in it he is both fully known and fully loved. And last week, 
Pastor Jason, he opened the series. It's a four-week series that we're going to do. He opened the series really focusing on what is the story of David leading him to write this psalm. And so if you weren't here last week, I just want to recap it real quick. Or if you were here last week, just to like put us in the right mind frame. David writes this psalm because what is, of what has happened. He's King David. He's, he's uh, chosen not to go to war with his brothers, with all of his soldiers. Instead, he's remained at the palace. And in going up on the palace, he looks down, he sees Bathsheba, and he lusts after her. He desires her. He has her brought to the palace. They commit adultery. She is impregnated. And David sets off on this, this, this scheming, these lies and deceit in which he's trying to to place the birth back on her husband Uriah. And ultimately what it leads to is him having Uriah sent to his death in battle. All in an attempt to manage sin in which he just multiplies sin. And after this, what David does is finally he comes to the point of repentance. Nathan approaches him and reveals the sin that, that David has committed and the consequence that he is going to suffer as a result of these sins. And here we find David repenting to God. And so really to start us off today, I just want to read through the entirety of Psalm 51. Uh, We're going to go through the next several weeks. We're going to kind of zoom in on specific parts. But I think it's important to keep the entirety of the psalm in focus. It says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me excuse me, cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it to you. Give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. And so today what we're going to do, we're just going to zoom in on four, four verses of this psalm. We're going to be looking at verses 3 through 6 and really just unpacking the depth of what David is doing in this act, this psalm of repentance and how he is presenting himself as fully known to experience how he was fully loved. And the first thing that we'll see in this, this, this psalm of repentance is how David acknowledges the depth of his sin. Verse 3 says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. We find David as he's writing this, he's just stewing in the reality of what he has done. The shame, the guilt, all of it is present before him. And he's just wrestling with what the, the, the hurt he has caused. In fact, what scholars believe of this is when David writes this, it's about nine months to 12 months after Nathan has approached him, revealed what what is known and the consequence that he will suffer for his sins. David has been dealing with the weight of his sins for a while now, up to a year. He's just wearing them and dealing with the reality of it. 
This isn't a guy who has just sinned and is, is seeking the quick way out. I can just picture like my kids. You know, I think we've all experienced if you have kids when you're teaching them to say sorry and they, they've done something maybe to their brother or sister and they just give that quick sorry uh, that they don't really mean and they're off to the next thing. They've tried to check their box. This isn't where we find David. David is in a moment of, of solemn reflection where he's just dwelling on the truth and reality of what he has done. And he uses some very specific words, his transgressions, my sin. From my understanding in Hebrew, there's actually three words uh, used to describe sin. And he uses actually all three of them throughout the passage, or throughout all of Psalm 51. Iniquity, transgression, sin. And he's repeating them here to draw attention, not to the different types of sin, they're all a description of sin, but he's kind of viewing his sin from different angles. He says, my sin is ever before me. The word sin here in the original Hebrew uh, is chata'a. It, it means literally to miss the mark. David is acknowledging that he has not lived up to the moral standing that God has for him. He's missed the mark. He hasn't lived up to the standing he has as an image bearer of God. He hasn't lived up to the standard as an as Israel, Israelite, one of God's chosen people. He hasn't lived up to the standing befitting the king of Israel. He should be living not to a lower standard, but a higher standard. And David says, in all of that, I have missed it. I have sinned against you, God. He's acknowledging the truth of his sin. And I love, uh, well, I love uh, this, this understanding of sin that I, I, I found in experiencing God. It's by Henry Blackaby. And he describes the essence of sin is moving from God-centered living to self-centered living. And that is what we found David has done in all of this. In all of it, he's moved from following God's ways to following the desires of his heart. When he has the opportunity to choose his ways, instead of choosing uh, uh, self-control, he chooses lust. Instead of choosing faithfulness and commitment, he chooses adultery. Instead of being truthful, he lies. Instead of, of transparency and, and openness, he deceives. Instead of valuing life, he chooses murder. Time and time again through all of this, David has not lived up to God's moral standing. And he uses another word. He knows his transgressions. Transgressions in Hebrew is the word pasha. And it translated directly to English would mean an overt rebellion against God and his ways and his laws. Here we find David owning, owning his choice. That he knew what he was supposed to do. He knew right from wrong. He knew what he was supposed to do in this situation. And he chose otherwise. He's an he's a, he's a Israelite. He's intimately familiar with God's law under the Mosaic Covenant. He knows even the basis of that law, the Ten Commandments. He knows that he is not supposed to covet his neighbor's wife. He knows he's not supposed to commit adultery. He knows he's not supposed to murder. All of this is present before him as he's doing it, and he chooses to disobey anyways. David is, is admitting to God, this isn't, this isn't him just sinning as a, a, a caught up in, in the bad circumstances of life. This isn't him in a crime of passion where he just loses control of his mental facilities, his physical facilities, and then comes to and is like, what's happened? No, this isn't my fault. No, he's, he's owning his sins. He's saying to God, I did this. I chose this. I know the wrong that I have committed. And it's a good perspective for us when we come in repentance. We own our sins. We acknowledge the truth that we alone have chosen to sin. We have to own our sin in the act of repentance. And as I look at David, I think a lot of us look at David, we can kind of create a caricature of him. What an evil man. Right? He, he, he committed adultery. He committed murder. This is a guy supposed to be after God's own heart. Look at the evil he has done. I don't, he doesn't seem like a guy after God's own heart in all of these actions. He got, seems like a guy who's chasing the ways of Satan. But what he's doing here, he's acknowledging the depth of our sin and when we look at him, it's a good reminder for us to acknowledge the depth of our sin. Because you and I, maybe we haven't committed adultery. Maybe we haven't chosen to murder. Maybe we have actually done these actions. But the truth is, we're no different than David. 
the bar that Jesus called us to, the understanding of the commands He gives, wasn't that they were just to not be done with their hands, but we were to cleanse them from our minds and our bodies. That if you have lusted after a woman, you have committed adultery with her in your mind and heart. If you have hated your brother in your heart, you've murdered him in your heart. The depth of our sin isn't just what we do with our actions, but that sin has pervaded our minds and our hearts. Are you addressing the depth of your sin? I remember as a child growing up in the Catholic school, we would, we would learn uh, to go in to confession, and we would go into the confessional with the screen in the middle, the priest on one side and me on the other. And I remember just going in and feeling like this is such a trite exercise. Here I am in front of the priest, and I'm, you know, like 15, 12, 13, 14 years old and telling him my sins. Like, yeah, I uh, said a couple swear words, and I, uh, you know, I was mean to my buddy for about five minutes, and, you know, I, 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 I didn't do some homework. I was addressing sin. It's true. These were sins. I don't want to downplay them, but I wasn't addressing the depth of my sin. I wasn't addressing the fact that I was lusting after my classmates. I wasn't addressing the fact that there were kids in my school that I remember on the playground. I hated them. I hated them. And often it led to like those, those elementary fights, the pushing and the shoving, right? I was sinful to my core and I wasn't addressing that. When we are going to repentance, we need to bring the totality of our sin and wickedness to God. Are you bringing the depth of your sin to him? He goes on to continue acknowledging the depth of his sin. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Now this specific passage of Psalm 51 can bring forward a lot of confusion because it seems like what he's saying is he sinned against God and no one else, which, which seems really odd because Bathsheba has been wrong, his wife has been wrong, Uriah has been wrong, Joab has been wrong. There's unnamed soldiers who have all been wronged and sinned against. What we know from the rest of Scripture is you can sin against other people. You can sin against your own body. And so it's interesting to find David saying against you and you only. It's a good reminder as we're reading Psalm 51 that it is a poem. And it's written in poetic structure with poetic techniques. And so this passage, this part of the, the Psalm 51 should be taken acknowledging that. And he's using the poetic technique of hyperbole, a technique that we use often in our day-to-day -day life. He's, he's saying something in a way to the, to the utmost extreme. And it's done with purpose. It's done to draw attention to something. So he's not saying he does, hey, I wasn't wrong Bathsheba or Uriah or all the other people involved in this, this sins. But he's saying above all of them, primarily, this sin was against God. Yes, he hurt other people. Yes, he sinned against himself and his body. But he has first and foremost sinned against God. And he has to bring his sin now to God, the one who he has sinned uh, against more than anyone else. That every time we sin, we have to remember that we are sinning against God and we have to pursue restoration, not just with the people we sinned against, but God himself. I think it's, it, for me in my walk with Christ, it was a, it's a step of maturity for myself when I had to acknowledge the sin that I was committing that didn't affect anybody else in my life that was really just against myself uh, was also a sin against God as well. And I had to pursue not just reconciliation with the people I'd hurt or myself, but God. And the best picture I can think of this that we have in front of us today, if you've ever been a parent if you've watched your kid, somebody wrong your kid, maybe you've watched them hit or lie or belittle, and you've just had that deep, deep hurt as your son or daughter is suffering, and like your kid gets up and they're over it, they, they hug it out and they walk away, and you're still left just stewing because you're, the, the thing you love most in life has now suffered. There's some, there's some picture of that as painting what happens with God. And I don't want to downplay sin if it's, as it's just a heartbreaking towards God, but God is heartbroken when we hurt and destroy his creation, when we hurt and destroy his, what he, he chose to bear his image. Are you acknowledging the depth of your sin and against, at who it is against? 
And this is actually a great thing as we disciple our kids, a practice that we can do. Are you modeling, uh, uh, seeking repentance to God? And, but are you, are you calling your kids to that? I think most of us as parents, we, we take our kids when they do wrong, we ask them to say sorry to their brothers or sisters or friends, but then are you taking them a step further and saying, you need to now take this to God and, and apologize to who you have ultimately sinned against. He makes this statement to set up the next part of verse 4. He says, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. He's acknowledging his sin against God and acknowledging now the consequence that comes with it, that God has the right now to judge David. God is a righteous, blameless judge, and he has, yes, sinned against people, but he has sinned against God. So God has every right now to, to cast judgment upon David. And so part of his repentance is not just dealing with the depth of his sin, acknowledging who he's sinned against, but also that his sin comes with consequence. And he's really presenting to God, I'm willing now to take the consequence. I have rightly earned this consequence, and you are right to give it to me. And really, it's kind of saying to everyone around him, God is not to be held in blame for what happens as a result of my sin. It's David's weight to bear. The, the loss of his son isn't on God, it's on David. God is a righteous, perfect judge, and now David's consequence isn't because of God, it's because of what he has done. And he's also looking at it saying, really, that he understands what he truly deserves in this moment. David understands that what he has done, the, the consequence for that, according to the law, is death. He broke, the, he broke the command not to commit adultery, and he broke the command not to murder. And under the Mosaic law, the law in which they live, both of those are punishable by death. Adultery was to have both, uh, um, both people involved in the, the act of adultery put to death, and murder was to require the murderer to be put to death. David was guilty of both. He should have, by all rights, been put to death for these actions. And he looks at God and says, if that's what I received, then that's what I deserved. I have caused this to happen. I deserve death. And if that's what his consequence is, he's, he's willing to live with it. But what's true about this, what we can take is that the, 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 it's the same truth for all of us. Each and every one of us as we sin, whether we murder or, or, or commit adultery, whatever sin, big or small, it's the same reality for us. The consequence that we deserve is death. When we look at Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. All sin, what you and I have earned is death. That's what each and every one of us have deserved. And, and not just deserve, but the word he uses is wages. What we have earned for what we have done is death. But what David is doing as he's throwing himself at the mercy of God is really just looking to what God desires. I've been, a, every, this year I've been going through the Bible every morning. I've been, I've been working through the Bible in a year and as I've gone through it, uh, as I read along, I've been also looking at videos of the Bible project. This is plan on version Bible app that I've been doing. And, and, and about a month ago, as I was going through it, it, the topic of sin came up. And it was this really interesting video by Tim Mackey, the, the voice of the Bible project. And he talked about the idea of sin and, and the response to sin that we deserve. And he kind of, he touched on this interesting idea that really just stood out to me. That the simple, obvious solution to sin for God would be to eliminate humanity. We were the ones who brought about sin. We brought about disobedience. We brought sin into the world. We were the evildoers. And the fitting, right, fair solution to restore everything to as it should be would be to eliminate the sinners. So you and I, when we sin, we should just be removed from this earth. We should die. And ultimately what he was getting at was Adam and Eve in their sin the simple, fair, really efficient solution to solve everything was for Adam and Eve to die. But that's not what we see in Scripture. 
That's not the God we have. God, we have, <laughs> he's not concerned with the efficiency. He's not concerned with the simple answer. What he does is he takes the long, arduous, difficult process of restoration. And that's what David is looking at. He's doing all of this, all of this presenting his sin and recognizing the consequence to look to the fact that repentance looks to restoration. He's looking to what God truly desires, not our death because of sin, but instead our restoration in sin. He goes on, verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive, conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. David writes now, just talking about this idea of sin. He's He's, he, he highlights in sin did my mother conceive me. Now this passage isn't meant to say that the act of conception uh, where his mother conceived him wasn't in and of itself a sinful act. What he's drawing attention to is the idea of original sin. Since David's conception, he has been in sin. He has always been a sinner. And this isn't an attempt for David to excuse his behavior. Well, hey, God, uh, you know, I, I murdered and, and committed adultery, but like, what, what would you expect? I'm a sinner. Instead, he's looking to what God has always done to sinners, what God has always desired with us as sinners. Yes, he's a, he, he committed these evil acts. He's always been committing evil acts. And he's highlighting this because in verse 6, he contrasts who he always is with who God has always been. He says, yes, I, from, my, from all time, been a sinner, been evil. But for all time, you have desired truth in my inward being. You have taught me wisdom in the secret heart. And he uses these two things, inward being, secret heart. They're all just to say the core of his being. But he uses this word wisdom. It's to mean not just knowledge, or, or, but really a, 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 an understanding of God's ways and the ability to live out this right living. God has always desired restoration for people. He has always sought restoration from sinners. That is what he has always been doing for him and for us. He desires restoration. He's actually contrasting David's character, or in this time, lack of character with the character of God. When we look at Exodus 34, 6 through 7, it's where one of the times God really reveals who he is, his character. To the Israelites, he says, the Lord, the Lord. And I want to just say that this is the, what Lord is, 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 is fully, uh, excuse me, fully capitalized. This is the name of God, Yahweh which actually better explains this because Yahweh, the idea is he has been, he is, and he always will be. God has been, he is, and he always will be a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God's desire for all time has been to, to reveal his overwhelming love by, not just solely by, but by forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that is what David is turning to. A God who desires to express his love in restoring him, in forgiving him, for taking all the evil that he has done and renewing him. And the beauty of all of this is it comes to its, its inevitable conclusion with Jesus. Jesus. That you and I, we, we look to a God who desired to restore us that, that, to the point that he would send his one and only son to die on a cross, take the entirety of the world's sins on his shoulder, to be the perfect sacrifice so that we could be restored. So when we come forward in repentance, we're not just looking at the evil of ourselves. The, we're not navel-gazing, just admiring or, or, or wallowing in how wicked we can be and how we are. We're taking all of that and taking it to God because he desires and he has made possible restoration. I'm going to go ahead and release the campuses. I love you guys. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for sticking around our transformational moment today. There's a couple of questions. The first one is, do you have a regular rhythm of repentance? 
Uh, repentance is an important uh, act that we can perform in which we are fully known and fully loved. Uh, but what we don't want to do is wait to repent when everything's falling apart, when we've just built up this entire dump truck of sins. Uh, it's important that we have a regular rhythm of repentance where we present ourselves uh, fully to God so we can fully experience his love. So uh, ideally, this would be a weekly, daily rhythm in which we come to God in repentance uh, so that we can experience his restoration. And the second question I have, is there something that you need to repent? Do you need to repent today? Maybe there's something that you've just been holding on to that you've been unwilling to address in your life. Uh, and, 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 right? it, we, we can never be fully known. Yes, God knows who you are, but he wants you to bring that to him. He wants to fully love you. And then when we hold on to it, when we try to hide it, we can't deal with our sin by hiding it. It always has to come to the light. So is there something in your life that you need to repent? I would really encourage you not just to do it alone, uh, but go to a trusted friend, maybe a pastor, whatever it may be, and, 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 and repent.